So we're with John Olson. Yeah, I'm John Olson. And with Cushing, Maine. Cushing, Maine. And one nineteen twenty-two. Twenty-two. Nine. It makes me ninety-seven now. Ninety-seven years old. See. And still working. Still working. Still got my lungs <laughs> open. Looking forward to getting in that pretty quick and setting my traps. And it's, and it's almost time for lobsters to come in. Yeah, it's just. I figure another week or two it be before I get it, if I get to it. But so going back uh, to the beginning, born in 22, you grew up then in the Depression. I grew up in the Depression. Did you know it was the Depression, or you just knew everybody was poor? <laughs> I knew it was the Depression, it was poor. Everybody was in the same boat around this area. I mean, everybody, well, which they don't do much of no more. They, all the kids worked. Mm -hmm. Had to work, they had to firewood and stuff together, and get ready for winter, and I was a part of it. Today you don't see none of that. That's gone up the door. So what all did you do and your family do then to make money during that time? Lobsters? Uh, I didn't start lobsters sometime in probably 1934, 36 in mm -hmm. that area. Before I started getting interested, and in that was only because probably my next door neighbor here, which is there was the Maloney's, and I grew up with the Maloney boy, and we done more or less everything together. His father went lobstering, and that probably is the reason I got into it. And of course, my uncle Alvaro, he was had been on the water fishing, and that. Got me more or less into it also, so from that time on I, I started lobstering. Of course we had an eight room schoolhouse up here on this point and I think it was open about three years when I started school. Yeah, about a two mile walk to get to that and then they finally had to close it. Third year I was in grade school, they closed it, and then I went up to where the fire station is now. There was one eight room schoolhouse there, and I finished my grade school through there. Then it was into high school. And by that time, I wasn't interested in high school at all. I was strictly wanted to go lobstering. So okay. that's what happened in that case, my mother got me through it, but uh, there was a story there, I think she got more of the, the book work than I did, <laughs> trying to get me through the school, and well, I got through it, and then, then once I got through it, I started going gloves and continuously, but, but it was, I bought a brand new boat, and I did. 40, 41, the fellow was building it. And the winter of 40 and 41, I went in the woods and I got a hundred cord of pulp wood. And that was... And that's how you paid for the boat? That's how I paid for the boat. And, and so May of 1942, the water, well, of course, December, 1941 is when the war started, and in May of 42, I was pretty sure I was going to get grabbed for the Navy or grab for the Army or something. And so I just, me and another fellow here in town, decided we'd want to go in the Navy. So we hitchhiked to Portland, Maine. Oh, you hitchhiked to Portland? Yeah, okay, in I May. Said, yeah, okay. in May. And they said, we went through all the examinations and got passed. So I come back and in August, I think it was, I joined the Navy. And so my new boat didn't, didn't get to use very much. And so I had to put that on the bank. I went in the Navy and I stayed till 19, Christmas of 1945. Okay. And so a little over three years. Yeah. Over three years, almost four, and that's 
where I ended. So you went in August of 42, yep. and you said you went to Rhode Island for training? I went to Newport, Rhode Island, which is an island down there. Mm -hmm. I went on the island. A lot of them was on the Newport itself. And I got three weeks boot training and came home for whatever the time was. I can't remember if it was a week or, or a month now. I don't remember just how long it was, but went back to Newport. Then they said, well, Hawking years going to Pacific, Hawks going to the Atlantic. And the guy I went in the service with, his, he was a C and I was an O, and I, so both of us fighted right there. <laughs> so he went to the Pacific and I went to the Atlantic. Okay, and what, so, what were you uh, deployed on? I was then I got back and they said, well, you know, the ones that's going to see in the Atlantic is going to the Brooklyn Navy Yard in New York. So I went there and they put me on a brand new destroyer and we had to put all the stuff aboard of it, fill it, it was brand new. So you were outfitting the ship to go? Yeah, we outfitted there and then we got, so the first trip we got underway, we came up to Sea Alarm off in uh, Final Haven here off in Rockland, Maine. Came up here unknown, unknown <laughs> to us that it was going to come to Maine for our training. You knew your way around here. <laughs> I lived in the short distance of the final haven. And you were back home. <laughs> back home, but we couldn't get off the ship. We just stopped until we got finished the training with it and see what was wrong with it. We went through all kinds of maneuvers. Well, the worst part was when I went in the service in Newport, we all slept in a hammock. We had to all learn how to sleep in a hammock. So, of course, when I went aboard the destroyer, that's all I had was a hammock, and we had to put that thing up every night and take it down in the morning. And well, that's the way that went. But I, well, I got a, kind of got ahead of my story a little bit. But we had got on the way out of Brooklyn Navy Yard, and we got off, and I think it was Rhode Island, or New Hampshire, I guess New Hampshire. We anchored for the night, and unbeknownst, so they asked for volunteers one day, and so I volunteered, not knowing that half the crew, well, more than the crew, probably three quarters of the crew was seasick. <laughs> so we had, they said, well, roll up your pant legs and take your shoes off. Well, so we didn't know what was going to happen. Come find out the mess hall had flooded. Had about a foot of water in it. Stuff wasn't working right. Well, we had all these guys that got seasick. I didn't have to get seasick. <laughs> and I volunteered to bail that out. <laughs> Me and a bunch of us. We got it bailed out. And boy, I said, after that, I didn't volunteer. You gotta be careful what you're volunteering for. <laughs> <laughs> no more volunteer for me. <laughs> we got through that, and then we came up here. Well, we came up to Portland, and we stayed in the harbor there at night, and we run up here to Vile Haven Seal Island, which was a place they had to an island that they was trying to. Well, I guess they're trying to move it off with the shells and debt charges and everything. We could use toffees or whatever they wanted to train on. And we'd done that for a few days, and then we went back to New York and the ship fitters and all had to fix all the problems on it. And then we got underway and we went to Bermuda off in South America picked up some tankers, and then some there, and then some in Trinidad. And we started across. We ended up in Dakar, Africa. The French fleet didn't, didn't have a, much oil, and we took a bunch of tankers there. And Dakar, is a, well, there's a lot of, I guess they call them Siamese troops, I think that's what they called them back then. And they had swords, long swords on them. They were big guys, big black guys. And we tied upside the dock. 
in the empty our GI can from a, what food we had left over and dumped extra in that GI can. Jeez, I took it off the runway, ran. And you guys, once they found out what was in it, they grabbed it away from the sailors. So they said, well, I'm going to do some billy clubs. Maybe that would kind of keep them. We didn't want them on the ship. And that didn't work at all. They come right aboard. And they said, well, best thing to do, just sit on the ramp, let them take it. And they were starving. So they dumped it right on the block there. We see what they were after. So that's what we did. But if you had any cloth or anything, man, they gave them most everything they had to get us some cloth. And we had this all rag lockers that we kept extra old rags in to use for cleaning stuff. So after that, that was the end of that trip. We come back to the States again. Then we went went to Casablanca was the next trip and took a bunch of convoy there for the army and dumped them, dumped them off and they said, well, you fellas can go ashore, but you're going to have three or four of you together. You can't go alone. You're going to have to have, because it's not safe. And stay, stay together. Don't, don't separate. Because you go up in the Casbah area or anything like that, and you, you don't know what might happen. So this is one of the. So we dumped everything there and came back to states again, loaded up with some other convoys, went back to Casablanca, and got rid of what we had, and we loaded a bunch of German prisoners brought back to this country and we got him back here well before we got him back here one of them hung himself we buried him at sea somewhere halfway across somewhere as it happened so we half masked the flag and everything gave him a burial and I understand a lot of them came up here to the state of Maine worked on some of the farms up here I, uh, I heard that this week, that there was um, uh, a camp uh, up in northern Maine, yep. and they worked. Yeah, yep. so they, worked. Uh, they left the camp and I worked, and they were paid. <laughs> I think okay. I got the article. But they worked up in the state of Maine, so we dropped them off in New York. Then we made another trip to Casablanca, and this time we went to Casablanca, but then we went up around the corner there, northern part of Africa, a seaport by the name of Oran. And we picked up a bunch of Italian prisoners. And those Italian prisoners, unbeknownst to us, they must have got a rumor that where they was going. And they was singing and having a hell of a time. They were celebrating. They knew where they was coming, because there's a lot of Italians in this country, and evidently they got word. That I didn't know it at the time, but I'd, afterwards I wondered why they were so happy about being a prisoner. <laughs> <coming. laughs> you know, well, they were getting to come to America. <laughs> America. So that's what happened. They came to America, and I don't know whether they went after that. But so after that, then I made a trip to. Algiers and pre got prepared for Sicily, which we didn't know anything about at the time. And we took a big convoy across. I think it was, it was an enormous convoy. And it took us 22 days, usually about 12 days. And we had a lot of slow stuff. And it took us 22 days to get across to. Uh, Jubarola. And when we got almost to Jubarola, the uh, we met a part of a fishing fleet late in the evening. 
and they wasn't going to move because they figured that they didn't know what we had for a convoy behind us. And they, the fishermen weren't going to move, and finally they told them they had to move because we had this big convoy. And we, they turned the searchlights on, showing what was behind us, and they got out of there <laughs> quick like They got out the way anyway. So then, because I went to Algiers, and then it came. So they said, we're well, headed for Sicily for the invasion of that. So it was 10 o'clock in the evening when we finally hit Gila Beach, I guess you call it. And this and was 43? That was in 43. Mm -hmm. And on the way hit the, that beach, Searchlight came on this destroyer I was on. And I said, oh boy, I said, I guess we're in for it. And whatever, whoever it was or whatever it was disappeared. They turned the shirt sight off and they, they turned it on to us and they see what it was. And, and they disappeared. I never did see them again. And the next thing we knew, the next morning, we opened up on Gila Beach. And that, and that was it. Well, of course, we, we used a lot of the guns and stuff before we got there but in, into the range. And what was your job on that destroyer? My destroyer, I'll show you. I was a powderman on a five inch gun and I had the powder case that I loaded into this five inch and it weighed 42 pounds and that was my job to load that five inch. The other fellow loaded 54 pounds I think it was a projectile that went ahead of it. And I tried it, but I didn't. I didn't have the muscles to. I didn't have the weight to, <laughs> to handle <move> that. <laughs> they, so they put me on loading the powder, but I had to get, make sure I got the powder case in first. And then she go, Grandma works in the bleach of the gun, and that was my job. Wow. All the while I was on it, I loaded a lot of them. Mm it's a wonder I can even hear today, but <laughs> the thing was terrible. And the worst part was the ship is never still. They're always rolling or something one way or the other when you load that thing and that barrel's going up and down. Everything's hooked up automatic. And the same as the mount, it turns automatic with the radar. It's hooked up all, all together. And the worst part was you never knew when it was going to fire because the firing crew was in the bridge. They could fire it any time they wanted to, but you had to keep it loaded. So you loaded it and then just loaded, waited. Yeah, we just waited. When we'd be standing there waiting for it to <laughs> go off. So that was one of the jobs. So that's the way that went. So then after so that... So that was Sicily. That was Sicily. And we went made a trip up we getting a, we was getting a then we had to leave Gila Beach and take four troop ships up around to the northern end of Sicily. Mm -hmm. One afternoon we started out there and we were supposed to be in the place of one of the other destroyers. Well that destroyer went ahead of us and the Germans or Italian, whoever was flying that at that time, because they had either Italians or Germans flying, and they got a bomb right in the middle of her. She lost all crew. The whole crew went with it. And that was the end of that one. But she was part of our flotilla. So you should have been there. Yeah. But the other destroyer that was went one ahead of, of the you. Lucky, one of the lucky spaces. But then. We got up to Palermo, I guess you call it. it was a fair sized harbor. And then four troop ships in there, and the Germans knew, or Italians, whoever was in charge of that, they knew they was there. And that morning, about three o'clock in the evening, they tried to, a whole bunch of them attacked us. And I guess there was planes everywhere, because we loaded a lot of ammunition. 
but they never got the true ships. And their fathers got ashore and started from that end back down towards the other ones. Yeah, the part of the personnel. But, but also when we were setting it, I kind of get ahead of a little bit there. We got a, the invasion of Gila. I think we'd been there two, three days. We had an ammunition ship sitting in between, in amongst us. And one afternoon, it must have been probably three o'clock in the afternoon, or late in the afternoon, they found that they knew about that ship and they they hit it. Hmm. And nothing never, that disintegrated with all that ammunition on it. And I presumed everybody was lost on that. But that was the end of Sicily for me. Mm -hmm. We was out of ammunition, so we had to come back to the States and reload. Then they started us on the trips to England and Ireland and Scotland. So then from then on we went run convoys to there. Preparing for the invasion. Yeah. Okay. So So you were carrying troops or supplies or they were carrying everything. 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 Okay. All, all they could get on them ships they were loaded right to the and I was just telling my daughter the other night she wanted us to come up eat with them in the evening. And I said, you know, one thing that kind of gets me is, I said, all those convoys we was making, I said, we took a pile of stuff to all these foreign countries. And I said, who paid for all that anyway? She was, she had to work in Washington, D.C. <laughs> and funniest look come over her face. She wouldn't tell me how they, where that money went. Mm -hmm. And I know we sent a pile of stuff to Russia. Mm -hmm. Went went to Russia. As far as I know, none of it's ever come back this way. No. And this is why I said, when I hear all this politicians <laughs> going on, I said, you know, kind of makes me wonder. I said, I got to see all this stuff. And I said, we never ever brought anything back here. We was always going that Right. Going that all going that way. So then Normandy come along and we was in Plymouth and we went to get underway for training before Normandy came out. And we was tied up to a steel buoy in the harbor there and somehow one of the screws got hooked into the chain on it and it ruined it. So they put us in dry dock and said, well, we'll wait and see if we can get a shaft or whatever they had needed to fix it. And I was sitting there, Normandy came up. They said, well, you're going. You're going on your way to, they didn't tell us where, Normandy, but that's where we was heading. And we had just one screw to work with. So they, they took you out of dry dock and sent you with one they screw? Told us, they told us clear from the Thiebo that the tug got us on our way. Hmm. I set six days in Normandy on the beachhead, loaded powder, whatever I had to do there with the gun. And the sixth night, one o'clock in the morning, we got a torpedo in the stern of us. He took 70 feet off now. I think there was 26 or 28 men was lost in it. Hmm. So that was that story. And where was that at? That, that where where in Normandy? Where that we? was in Normandy. Yeah. We was at anchor at the time in the mouth of the Seine River there. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. and so when that torpedo hit, of course that, that put everything out. I got one guy left from that that I know about, and he came here this summer and visited me this last summer. And he asked me, he said, where was you? I said, I was on that five inch gun when it hit. I said, it disabled everything. I said, we lost all power so we couldn't do nothing with it. And he said, I got grounded with oil from the bilge because it 
that's where they kept all the oil in them destroyers down the bottom of them. Mm -hmm. And of course you have to preheat it and all that stuff. And we kept her afloat, lucky. Oh, she didn't sink? She didn't sink. And where I slept was in the middle of her, back towards the stern. And if I'd been in my bunk, I wouldn't be talking to you today. Hmm. It took that part of it. And the worst part of these, or any of most ships, all the engines and all the pioneers in the middle. Mm -hmm. And the, you can't block it all off. But we had a, that hit fur enough in the stern, so it, we had it blocked off. Everything was watertight. Everything was dogged right down tight. So that, that was a godsend too. We kept her afloat. Okay, so you never had to abandon ship. You, they you abandoned just, us the next day. They, they took did? us off, took okay. most of the crew off in it. Okay. It's because they had to hook a seagoing tugs on it. To, they towed it back to England. Okay. And then from England, well, it got into Portsmouth, I think that's where they towed it to, Portsmouth Harbor. Then we got part way in and couldn't get no further. Well, come find out, friggin' screw had bent it down so she was Dragon fixing bottom. up on the bottom. Mm -hmm. So they had to get a diver down to, <laughs> and that's when we had divers from England. They didn't even want to touch it, but they finally got it off and got her into. Then, then they towed her from there around up into the northern part of Ireland, and I left her there. They mm -hmm. put my put me and uh, a bunch of us up in a camp up in Ireland. And I what was the name of that destroyer? Born, uh, Nelson, USS Nelson. Six, Nelson, okay. 623. Okay. And did they scrap it after that or did they get it repaired? Believe it or not, they brought her back to Massachusetts, Boston Harbor. Wow. Put a whole new stern on it. Wow. And I, le I left it in, in the island, and I got a ship back here, and that's the one I got on right there. Bonham Richard? Yeah. Okay. That's the one I got on. And that was a you carrier? Know? And she was a carrier being built in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. I was walking by her every trip I'd make back forth to England. They were putting this one together. Huh. And I said, God pity the man that gets on there. <laughs> And jumping Jesus, I got on it. You ended up on it. Yeah, 3,000 men. And then still we wasn't fully, we needed more men. But that's where I ended. And that's when you went to the Pacific? I went to the Pacific through the Panama Canal. We tore a few things up, get uh, through that. And then when we got to San Diego, California, we loaded everything that thing would carry. We had her loaded. Mm -hmm. Went to Hawaii. And this was and, late '44. Yeah, it had to be sometime in '44, mm -hmm. and we unloaded her. And we started out in the Pacific. I sailed 78 days. I never saw land huh. on that thing. And 90 days before I ever got my feet on land. Huh. I was on that thing for <laughs> 90 days. Never. Got got my feet on land on that thing. I was never so sick of a ship in my life as I was that. <laughs> and where all did you go in the Pacific? All over the place. Uh, every all place, yeah. We were launching planes. This this carrier right here flew only at night. Okay. They had to land on them decks at night, mm -hmm. which is, they earned every penny they ever got. <laughs> I'll tell you, I saw some, <laughs> some mighty few Crashes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, brave guys to do that well, at night. They, 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 yeah. they was the best. Yeah. They had to be the best to get on that deck. Mm -hmm. And that's what we did. We flew at night and we we traveled more or less by ourselves. Mm -hmm. And we'd go to these places and launch. And then we'd beat it. Oh, so you weren't part of a convoy? No. You were mostly no, on your own? No, we didn't convoy. We, Okay. We operated at night and we'd hit wherever the Admiral said they needed some help. We'd send these planes in. These planes had to get back to that thing. 
mm-hmm. <laughs> the instruments that back then weren't like they are today. So, so you were on there 44 and 45 then, yeah, and you finished yeah. the war on the I bomb on Richard. I was in the, sitting in Tokyo Bay when they signed that. You were? Okay. Yeah. That's yeah. where I ended up at. Everybody said, how did you get both places? And I had somebody the other day said, I, how did you get both? I said, well, I, when I went to Togus to get checked out, they brought it out. They said, well, is that unusual for a Navy man get both those chairs? I said, yes, it was. But, but I said, it was the end of the war in, in Germany. That was the end of the war. They said they needed him help in the Pacific, so I came up as one of them. I, had, I knew yeah. everything there was to know about it. No, that's unusual to see both. Yeah, know, to, it is. To have seen you know, Europe yeah. and the Pacific, and, and Italy and North Africa. I I mean, saw, really, every part I, of the war you I were was, involved in. I was in every part of that, this war that we had, I was in it. That's amazing. And I, I knew everything A to Z. I mean, mm-hmm. I was working all, all over these ships, and they knew. When I went to get out, the guy says, you know, we want you. He says, we need you to finish. He said, won't you please sign over right now? I said, no, I'm going home. He said, if you go home, you, you'll you never come back. And I all oh, I will, I'll be back. <laughs> he said, look, he said, we're, we're offering you all kinds of jobs to stay. Because you said, we're not going to have enough to cover us, and we want you. We know you know everything. This was after the Japanese surrender. Yeah. You wanted to go back home to Maine. Yeah, and they I wanted. wanted to get home. I hadn't been <laughs> home for almost two years. I mean, right. I'd been away from home, and I wanted to get <laughs> the hell away from it. I'd seen all I wanted to see. <laughs> this guy, he says, dear, we, we need you bad. He says, we'll send you anything to keep you here. I said, well, that's just what happened. I come home, but I never went back. So you retired and left and uh, <laughs> yeah. had a lobster boat sitting here waiting on you? I had my lobster <laughs> boat. Well, the new one that I had built had ruined it sitting on the bank, it, you know, sitting right out in the sun. And I, it didn't pan out. So then I, I fished with that for a few years got by with the struggles with it, and then I had a, another brand new one built. And this is where it went. And now they, of course, they tell me about some of us in World War II that you never got much help. I said, no, I didn't. When I got out of the service, I didn't get nothing. I come home here and I said, I worked in the woods that when I, my father had to own a sawmill. Well, he, he bought it in '43. I come home out of the service before I went to Pacific. And he said, The sawmills come up for sale. He says, I don't have the money to buy that much of it. Well, I'll tell you what, you take whatever I got, you buy it. So he did. He bought it. And he run it till he couldn't run it no more. And I said, you know, I worked part time in that, but I decided I did enough of that kind of work. I didn't <laughs> need to work in the woods. <laughs> well, the first thing he did, he, he had this big lot up here, and it had these enormous big pines on it. So we cut them with old cross cut saws, one man on one end of it and the other man on the other end. Well, I worked a while on that, and, and that's when they first came out with chainsaws in the woods to cut uh-huh. trees down. Mm-hmm. So I said, talk to him about it, and he said, well, there's a place, I think it's up where she came from. Let's go and take a look at it. So he did, and he bought one. <laughs> well, that one end of it weighed 90 pounds. Oh, you wow. Know, <laughs> you had to carry that around in the brush, trying to cut these pine logs out. Well, we bought it. And the other end didn't weigh much of anything. <laughs> and I run the end with a 90 pounds. And I had, I run it well to, up to about 
to about March, I guess, and then the weather started warming up. And I decided, you know, I think there's something better than this to do. Yeah. <laughs> so I started digging what you call clams. So I could dig them. I mm -hmm. learned that from a kid. And I started digging clams. There, well, there was there was a little money in it for March, but better than anything else. So I dug that spring of all spring, made a little money, got some ahead. And today they sell them by the pound. And when I started digging that spring, there had been nobody in this river digging clams because everybody was tied up with sell the, the French plants. So there's one other guy, he dug 16 bushel that morning and I dug 14. He beat me two bushels. <laughs> now, I was good at it. He's, so I finished that out for two, three years doing that in the spring because they had factories around here that bought them. And now they're down to buy them with a pound. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's just no, no, they've got them almost depleted. But then I kept going lobster and working with this and that. That's how I got by. But. So you've had 70 years of lobster since yep. then. Yeah. So then I, 1952, I said, well, I've had enough of this other work. I'm going strictly right full-time lobster. So I've been ever since 1950 full-time. 1950 lobster. Yeah. And you built this house, you said, around 53? 54. 54. I, bought the, I bought the land in 53, and 54 I built the house. So you how has uh, how has lobster changed over the years? Oh my God. <laughs> it's nothing. When I started fishing in this river back those days, probably, I don't think there'll be more than five guys this whole river. It's right up to Thomas and uh, it's a long ways. And right now, I don't know. There's, some say there's close to a hundred in this river. There's an enormous amount of people. Just this one river. Just this one river. Then, of course, I went winners, which I fished way the hell off where these fellows are now. Some of, well, some of these guys have went even a lot further. But back then, all I had was a fathom meter. And the first one I bought, a fathom meter, the first one known around, it was around 50, 52, 3, somewhere in that area. And the one I bought, I could only go 50 fathom. Hmm. And I was fishing off some of them places over 50 fathom. That's six foot to a fathom. A lot of water. And my fathom wouldn't be wouldn't even reach the bottom. <laughs> and, and you were telling me earlier that then you just pulled the, ro the ropes and yep. lifted the traps we went, by well, hand. When I started, it was all yeah. by hand. Yeah. If you were lucky, you might have a donkey engine they rigged up, tried to haul by hand, which you wouldn't gain that much. And what's the weight of the trap and everything then that you were picking up by hand? Oh my God. It must be close to 100 or better. Hundred pounds, yeah. And so you're you know, picking that up by hand. By hand, by a hundred of them a day. Yeah, <laughs> if you did, no, well, most of them didn't back then. Okay. When they haul by hand, they, like you probably fifty would get about fifty a day. Yeah, you know, mm -hmm. about all you probably would want to do, mm -hmm. unless you were a regular bull at it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, most then you had to roll. I mean, you didn't have power or nothing to. You had to use always to roll with, and. It's come a long, long way. Now Maybe. you got mechanical hoists, and yeah. so guys can yeah. do, you said 800 a day? Now they're up to 800. Okay. Well, it was up to 12, but they cut it back. Yeah. Now they got these hydraulic heads they finally invented. Mm -hmm. You just hook the rope into it. You, you don't, all you do is just push just it. Pull it up in a, in a jiff, huh? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> nothing. Yeah. It's unbelievable. Yeah. And now they've They've got all kinds of stuff they're putting into it, and now they're having trouble with whales and stuff. The lines are getting tangled in them, and they, oh, they're having awful times with it. 
Oh, the whales will get caught up in the lines. In the lines, and, and and it's not all the fishermen's fault either. Is to get all these tankers stuff that's running back and forth across the ocean. There's a lot of and the environmentalists are into it. And God, it's I don't know where it's going to go before it gets done. And you're still working a couple hundred traps, you said. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, try to work. I don't haul a couple hundred a day. I haul. I go. Well, like people ask me, how many you haul? I said, I haul till I feel tired. When I feel <laughs> that's it, I come home. Okay. I said, I, 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 I said, I am. Don't have a deadline. You got to hit. No, <laughs> I, I no deadline. Why? Why should I have a deadline? You know. I mean, I feel if I feel I, I want to sit down. I sit down. I mean, you know. And, and how many times a day do you usually work them? A lot of these uh, guys go out at 2 a.m. and in the evening I also? I might say, that right now, I figured if I haul them twice a week, yeah, that's enough. That's enough. That's enough for my age. Okay. I mean, I, hey, they ain't no, well, I just talked to the fellow that launched my boat. He's got a hydraulic haul that does everything. And he says, I don't know of anybody your age is fishing. He says, I've been all, I, all boats are everywhere, you know. You've got them all. <laughs> so, so. But some of these guys are going out twice a day, aren't they? Two a.m. and then later in the evening also. Well, they call all day. They do when all they day. When they go at two, and they they're way the hell off. It takes them about two hours or more to get off there. Okay. Just steadily sailing, and some of these guys stay all night. They hmm. sleep in the boat, stay all night. So, no, they only haul what they. One day, and then, like these stay all night, they could haul the next day. They'd start in where they left off. They'll float the lobsters. They got crates they can put them in. They just float them. Okay. And when they get ready to come home, they load them on the boat, come back in. Yeah. But like I said, it's overdone. You don't need to be doing this stuff. But but what it's doing is. These guys that stay in here, they're coming in with big catches and they're forcing the market. And I mean, if lobsters say $5 a pound today and they come in with two or three thousand pounds of lobsters, they put a, they knock the price down. Oh, okay. That's what so that's all over about. overfishing yeah, it hurts the market. The, um, nobody knows for sure what these loaves would do for sure. So they, I've always said they, they figure they come from off there into here during the summer. Mm -hmm. But we don't know for sure. But we have got some information. We tagged them and try to see where they're going and when they're coming back. But there's so much in there. It, I don't know if anybody. I probably I know more about it than any of them. <laughs> Actually, because I had a guy that lives over here on the other side of this point, he's down Port Clyde, and I had a fellow from Arnold up here to Vanguard. He was a professor, one of them colleges up there. He came here oh, a few years ago, and. He'd been over in Port Park. He said, uh, he says, I was sent over here to you. I said, what do you mean I was sent over here to me? He said, well, you know Dougie Anderson? I said, yeah, I know Dougie Anderson. He said, if you want to know anything, you go and see John Oatson. He could tell you the story. <laughs> <laughs> so he came in and wanted to write a book for the college, I guess, or whatever. I think I got part of the book. Around here somewhere, and he started asking me a question. He says, well, "I understand you, you fishermen have lines who, that you fellows go by." Well, I said, "Yeah, we do have lines. I guess you want to call it that." He said, "Would you mind telling me how much of this stuff you know?" I said, "Look, before I even start to talk to you, I'm going to tell you one thing right now." I'm not going to tell you much, because I said I have to live with these fellas. And if I give you a lot of information, you put it in a book, and they start reading it, 
my name could be Bud. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I said, I'll tell you a few things, and that's all I'm going to tell you. You left them to go on your own. So that's just what they did. But that's part of that honor system we were right. talking about earlier. Yeah, you, the you lobstermen watch. have an honor system <laughs> between you guys that's respected. Yeah, there is. <laughs> and that, you don't see that a lot of business today. No, you don't. Where people have that honor code right. that yep. you guys observe so strong. Sweet. You don't fish each other's traps. <laughs> right. You, you color code them so you know what's yours, right? <laughs> that's... And and you don't mess with theirs, and they don't mess no, with yours. That's, if you do, you could. If you they find out, then you're in a problem. That is that is unusual that you guys still <laughs> yeah. conduct business yeah, that's off handshake and honor. That and still goes on. That's pretty remarkable, isn't it? Yeah. Today, but we we get an island off here, and I bite bite you on there, and they go to up to a year or so ago, maybe two years ago. They had to carry guns in the boats. <laughs> That's how, how serious it was. <laughs> and boy, there was a lot of it done. They, they fired one another. Oh, so they weren't, they weren't honoring uh, <laughs> no, the, no. the honor system. <laughs> <laughs> if you got, you know, you had to be in a certain area and you was in that area, you better be looking out. <laughs> oh yeah, it was just like the coys and what you had out west, the same idea. I mean, that's what it is. And it's just like this, this is St. George over there. They got, mm -hmm. we got respect for them and they got respect for us. Yeah. Well, but that's I, great. You don't see a lot of that today where people <laughs> still do business with respect. You know, you try to stay somewhat in your own area. Cause yeah. Uh, it's, it's interesting, I mean, you know, but that professor came from my college, he thought he was going to learn all this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I sent him right down, I said, nope. right now, I said, I'm going to tell you what's what. I said, I'm not crossing that line. I said, I, I know what I know and you're not going to find it out of me. <laughs> but it's, you know, it's, it's, there's a lot to it. That's what I say. I mean, I, I probably got the biggest cab, vocabulary that anybody around this old area knows what moving on. Well, you've seen a lot of years of it, starting yeah, I mean, at, uh, what, 14, you said? Yeah, and you know, so, I mean, I knew it from way back, even before, before I even started fishing, because I hit the old fellas, and I took interest in them. It was a different situation, all different, actually, because you, I start looking back, I remember what this one said and that one said, what he done, and it all goes right on the generation. Well, it's just like that. The three pages there, this woman wrote to that house up there, and that's where I got it from. And you were yeah. born in that house next that's door on the yeah. second floor. Yeah, and that came from Utah, and it tells about it. this woman, she wrote to somebody in that house. And it says she lived on a, something like a Nile. And she's talking about the engines attacking people there. And she says, as yet, they haven't bothered me. She says, I have an arsenal of guns. And I can't imagine what there was <laughs> not old muskets. How, long, how fast could you load one of them? And, and she said, my husband's gone maybe a week to a time, and it's all written right down that letter. Wow. And it was right in 1952, I think. Huh. And I just, with luck, had to pick that up, and I've hung on to it all these years. Wow. <laughs> so, and that was in Utah. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> what can you say? I mean, you know. And so she was writing to somebody that was staying somebody at the house. Somebody she might have been related to him. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, was, I had never figured it out. My daughter did. I think she. Well, it became a prominent place. Yeah. Andrew Wyatt, the yeah. artist, stayed there. Yes. And all the way down through the houses. They used to come to that horse and buggy. They used to stay in it. They used to have a picnic roof on it, mm -hmm. uh, a bungalow, four sided. And then my great great grandfather changed it because they, they had people coming in. I guess it made more room. Okay. So they put a different roof on it. Mm -hmm. And 
that's how it how that's come around and well everybody says you you've got the history you know, there's a lot of else? history in this area yeah I mean you know, and you you've seen a lot of it I see it changing all from all these towns or cities here and, and I should I should sit down and just write a book on everything he is here to talk about because I know it. I mean nobody else has got it because they're all dead. All the old people are gone. There's not a, I don't know of a soul now. I've, I've lost all contact with anybody that would know anything about it because most of the kids have sold the land and gone elsewhere because the money's been been elsewhere. Mm -hmm. But I chose to stick it out. <laughs> Here I am. Still but, at it with yeah. the uh, with the boat and the traps yeah. and. I mean, but it's taking care of you. It's kept you healthy. It's, well, this is it. I mean, well, my aunt, she was sick. I mean, she had only knows what. Well, they they've named everything they can think of that she's had. But there was a girl that lived in Nick's house over here. She had the infantile paralysis, and I think that was part of it. Okay. And she was getting, I think she lost the left, left arm use of it, and and she finally was getting it back. And what happened? She got messed toward the ear. And back then they couldn't do nothing about it. And that poison killed her. I had one uncle that had the same thing happen to him. That drainage and stuff, it was poison. Wow. And well, well, it's like my last wife. She had, uh, uh, I had to take her four times a week to bath. They had to change, they changed what they, they call it. I think right now, I can turn on the end of my tongue. They had to put on a machine, and she had to go to the bath or where, where they build the destroyers. And they put on a machine, and she'd be on that, I guess, four hours a day. And the last of it, she, it, where they hooked her up, they had a problem or something would happen. I'd, I'd have to take her to Portland, the big hospital, and they'd get it fixed. And she'd done that for a year. So the last time it happened, she said, I took her to Portland and they called me up here. They said, we want you to come down. She doesn't want to live anymore. I said, well, okay, I'll be down. I went down, they had a bunch of nurses and doctors. I said, she wants, she wants to pull the plug. And I said, well, it's her life. Do whatever she wants to do. I said, I can't, I'm not telling her what to do. And so that's what happened. They pulled the plug, he said, I said, well, how long will it be? He said, and it won't be a month. He says, the poison will take a while. It took probably a few days, we don't know. Three days, that's all it took. She pulled the plug, that was it. Is so she that, buried here at the, uh, at the yeah, family she's plot? she's buried in my cemetery. Well, she, mm -hmm. Container, but she yeah. didn't want a regular funeral. She chose to be burned out. So, mm. so she said, we had in the cemetery. But, but that, you no, know, I said, well, I can't tell her what she wants to do. I mean, it's up to her. I mean, she had to go through all this stuff. And God, I go down, I, well, I had to make one in the morning and one in the afternoon because I didn't have nothing down there to do. So I'd come home. Work a few hours in the back, pick her up. See, some days she come out there, hardly walk. I said, boy, this is something, nothing I'd want to go through. Right. <laughs> I'd rather they pull the plug and say, the hell with it, you know, if you're that bad off. And I should get something else. This is a picture that, that's Andrew Wyatt's wife. Wow. That's it. 
and she's still alive, but she's got Alzheimer's. Oh, is that right? Okay. And she's headed. I visited her over two years ago, and she, when I went to think she was living down here on an island, which they had done, done over and everything, a nice place. And while I was talking to her, I knew she had a little bit of a problem, but I didn't know what it was. And and so, and so he's buried here as yeah, well. Yeah, she's the one that came to me. She said, "We'd like to be buried in that cemetery." Well, I says, "I don't know." I said, "Well, see what the rest of the people have got to say about it." So I went around that, and they said it was all all right. Yeah. So. I was telling you about the morning coming, <laughs> and I didn't know nothing about it. That's when you oh, found out you were in charge. <laughs> that's when I got, and it kind of struck me, I was eating my breakfast, and he said, what do you mean? I said, yeah, he said, you you got to pick out a spot for you. And half of them don't believe he's in there now, but I said, well, okay. So we went over, there was snow on the ground, and I walked around, and I, so I told You picked that, a place, and, and the place. they dug it. Yeah. Yep. And she'll go there too as well yeah, then. She'll evidently go there. Well, okay. while I was sitting there talking to her, I said, she said, uh, see them pictures on the wall? I said, yeah, I see pictures on the wall. And she says, she kept looking at it. She said, you see that picture? She pointed to certain pictures. Was that one there? Well, I didn't know there was all other pictures there too. Yeah. And finally she hollered at the lady who was staying with her. I said, come here a minute. Will you pick that picture of him up? <laughs> Let him look at it. I guess, I, I guess before that, she said, bring that picture over to me. And I looked at it, and she looked at it. Finally she says, take that picture out of that frame. I said, oh, well, she going to now. And she signed it, yeah. <laughs> and she wanted me to sign it. And I said, yeah. I figured she just wanted to hang it back up on the wall. She says, put it back together. The lady put it back together and says, that's yours. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, where did you get that picture from? I don't remember nothing about that. Mm -hmm. And then I got thinking. I used to go to some of the birthday parties, and this is where this come from. Oh, okay. She got one of them guys must have took a picture because she had a camera crew and stuff. Had that put together. And I said, well, for God's sakes. Wow. Well, she says, that's yours. And as far as I know, I've never seen any pictures of me around with her anywhere. Huh. And <laughs> she gave it to me anyway, <laughs> so I hung on to her. That's but, awesome. You know? Yeah, there's a long relationship between their family and yours. Well, you see, she uh, she summered over on this next point that comes over here. And uh, as kids, we all played together. She's only three three months older than I am. Oh, okay. She grew up here summer. She come up here summers from Buffalo, New York. And we all, her sisters and all of us all played together. And, and where does she live now? She uh, she ain't up here now. Okay. It's down in uh, Pennsylvania. Oh, okay. Down in Chad Fort. Mm -hmm. That's where they go in the winter. That's where Andrew come from. Okay. But he used to originally, his father came to a place over in Port Clyde. They own a place over there. And they built, she, she and Andrew built a place up here in Cushion. Okay. They own a whole chunk of land up here. Mm -hmm. And because she met Ando, she was about 16, 17, she wasn't very old. We all used to get up there and play in the hay and everything else, especially I used to farm this whole thing, that barn up there, correct? I put hours and hours in putting hay in that for the winter. And so I'm, she was just unlike another person. No, her, me, her whole life. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, it still doesn't mean a thing to me. I mean, I know who she was and all that, and we all, you know, doesn't mean to me. She was a, 
150 million <laughs> lady. I mean, <laughs> still the same bestie to me. That's right. I grew up with. So, so and I used to go and visit. And then when I last, a little over two years ago, I knew she had a problem. And I said right off, quick, she's got, she's yeah. got it. So and it, they kept her alive. But I was talking to somebody here a while ago. Used to be down there with her. And they said she don't know nobody. No. She don't know nothing. She said, you might you might think she knows you, but two minutes after you leave, she wouldn't know she didn't even talk to you. Mm. So they're just keeping her alive because she got money. They can feed her. Right. Drugs. Mm. That's the only thing bad about drugs. <laughs> they can keep you. She got anything at all inside of you, I guess. I guess they can keep you running for a while, but. Christ, I didn't even know that. Was, I didn't even know that it even existed until I went down to visit and she found, to, kept pointing at this picture. And I, I kept looking and shaking my head. I, what the hell is she talking about anyway? Well, it shows how much uh, you and your family yeah. all meant to her yeah. and her family. You know, so yeah. it's, uh, so, it means something. And you know, those uh, relationships mean a lot that you've built over the years. So now, the place up there, you know, it's just like. It ain't my place no more. I mean, I, mean, I, I go by it and I think, geez, I said, I got all the good times I've had with it. And now it's. A lot of history there. It's overtaken and I like to see it taken care of and all that. That's fine, but, but, oh God, I beat people from all over the world. I mean, it's, it gets a little scary. It's just like I did, like I had the, People from Edinburgh, Scotland come over here, and the whole television crew, and I was tied up a whole day with them. And they ain't the old one. I've had a, I don't know how many Japanese films they've taken of me, a lot of them. But uh, last few years, I said, I want a tape of everything you do. And they said, so I've got tapes from all over the place. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know when the last time I looked at one. <laughs> I get them like this, put them in the closet. I said, somebody will see them someday. Well, we talked about a while ago, I mean, you've seen the Depression, you've known hard work, you've seen war, you've lobstered for 70 years. Jesus. Kids today don't learn all you know. What would you want to, what would you want to tell a kid today? All I got to say is, I went to all this foreign land, and what I've seen, I said, I just wish they'd realize that what this United States is. I mean, I don't, I'd hate to see what hap might happen to it. I mean, when I see what's happened in all these foreign countries, what they're all squabbling about, I said, God, I said, I put most four years into it. And I said, I realize what this country is. I mean, it's it's un, unknown, it's unusual. I mean, Jesus, stuff that we built for other countries is tremendous. I mean, most of the kids today have no realization of what what we did in World War II, the ships and loads and the stuff we built in this country that went to those foreign countries, and they don't appreciate it. They're out for the money. But the, that's all I could see. You'd pull in them ports. Oh, you're from the United States. You could see right off quick what they wanted. Mm -hmm. They can't. Well, I imagine, yes, there's a few probably would appreciate it from over there, but I don't know. But it's it a great is. country with a lot of opportunity. It Still. Is. This country's got so much. And I said, and when you stop and think what we put together in World War II in a little matter of a few months, it's unreal. Every man child here worked in this country. When I was, when I grew up with depression time and see what what we went through and these kids today got too much, way too much. 
they don't. It's a lot of waste. Well, you can't imagine the condition the world would be in if you guys had not sacrificed to protect freedom like you did. That's what I said. They don't. They just don't know. I got two guys that's working on that dock down there. They got no idea what what I went through to, so they could have a job working there. Mm -hmm. Oh, he's got money. He can do it. But they don't realize what the hell I had to do. Starting from nothing. Yeah. I started with nothing. I started with pad bridges. My mother and father didn't. Well, I could tell you one story. My mother came from Massachusetts, from a big farm, and her brother died. And my father didn't have money enough to buy a license for it to register a car to go to Massachusetts. That's how bad it was. And if I used to tell them guys, they think I was talking to my head. He tried to borrow money off my grandfather. My grandfather said, I ain't got nothing. But he finally got enough money to license the car to go down there for see him buried, her brother. Now, you, I can, I saw that, and I wasn't very old either, but I always remembered it. And I just think that. These people don't realize what what the hell the pressure was. But crazy the people were jumping out windows and everything else in the big cities. They lost their jobs. And it was hawk. At least we did. We had a garden. We could scrunch along, eat a few potatoes or whatever we could cook. Well, what we did around here, we swapped a lot of stuff. People had farms. They had pigs, cows, and bulls and stuff. They'd swap. Mm -hmm. One from the other. So that's how it worked. I'm telling you something, maybe you didn't even know something about it. I don't know. But, but this is what went on. No, I've heard those stories and yeah. they're, they're remarkable. And, and you hope that we don't see well, times that tough again, but I have to hope that the see, American spirit's still alive and people will figure out how to rally and take care of each other. This is what scares me when I listen to television and see these politicians. I mean, geez, they got millions, they got billions, and they got these big factories and stuff. I mean, their kids is the ones that's getting it, and yeah. they don't realize how hard it was to right. those factories to be built up what they was. Right. And when I see the shiploads of stuff that went to Russia and all them places, I said. I wonder where all that money come from. Um, I can't give an answer on anybody. How the hell did they, who paid for all this stuff? That I was getting like 48 or $50 a month and working my freaking ass off more than destroyer. Unreal. Did I put a book under there? Right here. Here's one. Yeah. Really. I am with a. Oh, yeah. That fella come from Iowa. Just with me. You were just a kid then, weren't you? Yeah, <laughs> just a kid. As a carrier, but. And as a destroyer that I was on right there, I won't lose that page if I can help it. The I was on that second mount, that first mount, it was a five inch, that second one just in front of the bridge, that's the one I was on. And the stern was what was hit? Yeah, I'll right. show you the stern. Okay. Just right right there. back in there. Yeah, that took the whole, that mount that was back there took that completely out of the way. It's amazing she didn't go down. <laughs> Taking that kind I of a hit. I said if that put top here and hit another. 10 feet, she probably would have gone to bottom, bottom up with the whole crew. Because mm -hmm. once they get into that midsection, that's all. You can't close off enough hatches to that's it. save and it. Yeah. The engine room, you can't close it off. Yeah. 
That's all it had would have took was that one Ten more of, feet, huh? Well, wow. I'd say ten more feet because yeah. I swept right on, almost up to that bulkhead. Wow. Another thing I didn't say to you, talking about swinging in our hammock. Mm -hmm. The first year I was aboard that destroyer, that's all I could, had for sleep was a hammock, a hammock hung up in the air, swinging around the air. <laughs> that's what, and you can imagine to try to sleep in a hammock, curled up. Swinging around in the seas. Yeah. That's what mm -hmm. I slept in the first year, mm -hmm. up in her nose. Well. <laughs> Boy, I'll tell you, some wild rides in that <laughs> part of that thing. Well, that's where I slept. A whole year before I got a cot to sleep in. Yeah. So how late into the season will you be taking the boat out? Uh, I planned on probably October, November. I'm going to go to fish yeah. a few months this summer and let it go with that. I said, I don't need to be doing that. I said, better for me here get the thing out of the water so I don't have to worry about it sinking or something because the boat's old. Yeah. Well, I want to try and come back in the fall then and, and see you make a run. Okay. <laughs> that would <Yeah>. be awesome. <laughs> well, I guess if I was a norm, I'm, I'm, I'll be around here somewhere maybe. Uh, oh, I'll find you. <laughs> yeah. You might find me over there. <laughs> no, you don't know. go there yet. We don't want to <laughs> no. do that yet. Well, they all say I you. <laughs> Everybody I see says, well, I think he'll make it another session, but who knows? I mean, you know, I'm at, I'm at the end where <laughs> anything could happen, you know? I mean, I, well, we'll just have to keep going. Now, what I do now, I work just, and if I feel that i feel feeling just right, I, I quit right where I am. You've had enough. <laughs> yeah.